Welcome to What Were They Thinking, a true crime podcast. I'm your host, Philip Tomasso. Hello, and this is Philip Tomasso. Welcome to the latest episode of What Were They Thinking, true crime podcast. Today is Monday, March 13th, 2023. We're going to be doing a story that I'm calling Sinking Suspicions. It's about a uh, someone trying to cover up a murder and not accomplishing their initial goal. Let's dig right in. April 3rd, 2002, police recovered the body of Patricia Walslick from Guilford Lake. You heard the 911 call just a moment ago, or a portion of it. Her husband, Peter Walslick, told emergency responders that at the scene of the crash, his wife swerved to avoid a deer on a county road and accidentally drove the vehicle into the lake. Was it just a motor vehicle accident that killed Patricia, like Peter wanted police to believe? Or as police dug for answers, would they find a multitude of motives to make them suspect Patricia's death was no accident, but that she had been murdered? instead. So here we go with sinking suspicions. So about 168 miles southeast of, uh, southeast of Rochester, New York, about a, a two and a half hour drive is Guilford, New York. Now I did indicate we're going to be hanging out in the western New York, Rochester area. This is close enough, I believe. It's still in New York and it's not that far. And I first learned about the case of Peter Walswick uh, while reading the book Forensic Files Now, authored by Rebecca Reisner. This is a great book that reviews some 40 actual crime cases and uh, was assembled from blog entries on her website. She entitled the series Seeds for Doubt, which is spectacular for this title. Um, I went with Sinking Suspicions for this particular story because she already took seeds for doubt <laughs> but it's her right she got to it first or before i did anyway uh and there was an episode of the crime uh featured on forensic files the television show so according to a cape gazette article published on march 11th 2021 heather walswick has been fighting to free her husband peter from jail in new york because she says he's wrongfully convicted of killing his wife almost 20 years ago she's not alone the nonprofit center for factual innocence took up the cause and they even put peter's name on the hood of a car that raced in the general tire 150 in arizona on march 12 uh, 2021 which is interesting actually but i think we're putting we're putting the cart before the horse here so who who is Peter Walswick, and which wife was he convicted of murdering? Obviously not the one sticking up for him uh, right now, Heather. She comes along a little bit later. In the early morning hours of April 3rd, 2002, police recovered the body of Patricia Walswick from Guilford Lake. Peter had alleged while intoxicated, his wife had driven their truck into the water. Court papers said Walsnick told emergency responders at the scene of the crash that his wife swerved to avoid a deer on County Road 35, and she accidentally drove the vehicle into the lake. This is according to Peter. He later changed the story to indicate his wife had intentionally driven into the lake. But not buying the details Peter was selling, police believe the man murdered his wife and then staged the accident to camouflage the events 
of the previous evening. So less than nine hours after Patricia was pronounced dead, Peter was on the phone with the insurance company eager to collect on the life insurance policy. Working as a registered nurse at the hospital in Sydney, New York, and yes, that is the actual name of the hospital, the hospital, Patricia Shoemaker first met Peter Walznick when he was visiting relatives in the area. Originally from New Jersey, Peter worked as a truck driver transporting new cars on the beds of 18 wheelers. Peter ended up moving to Sydney and in 1996, the two eloped in Las Vegas. Pretty romantic. Together they had three daughters, plus Patricia had a son from an earlier relationship. The two also owned the Angel Inn Bar, complete with a dance floor and a stage for hosting bands. Although the couple was known to flirt with the patrons of the bar, they also seemed happy together. Happy enough, anyway. When Patricia arrived home after a long shift at the hospital on April 3rd, she and her husband realized they had had a miscommunication. Each thought the other was supposed to pick the kids up from the babysitter's house. So together they decided they would take a drive down to the sitters and retrieve their children. So in the episode on forensic files that I watched, they made plenty of references around Patricia's issue, Patricia's issues with alcohol. They never came out and, and called her an alcoholic, but they said she drank regularly and insinuated a potential problem with the amount she drank nightly. Though they had both arrived home from work to the empty house, the show left me with a feeling like if Patricia was already drinking, she'd already been drinking when she got home or on her way home. So why on earth was Peter going to let her drive the truck. Patricia did have a few DWIs under her belt. Regardless, though, Peter initially told police while on the way, Patricia became slightly distracted with her cigarette ashes, and when she brought her attention back to the road, there was a deer on the pavement. She swerved to avoid hitting the deer. So their 96 GMS truck drove down a small embankment and plunged into the cold water and immediately sank, according to Peter. The average depth of the lake, this particular lake, is 34 feet and 70 feet at the deepest point. Uh, although Peter was able to free himself from the vehicle, his attempts to save Patricia failed. Peter ran to the home of Thomas and Jessica Becker uh, of Norwich for help, and from there, Thomas called 911. Now, even before first responders arrived on scene, Peter brought Thomas and Thomas's friend to the spot of the lake where the accident occurred. The truck, not completely submerged, had drifted some 35 feet away from shore. Thomas, uh, the neighbor, rounded up a wetsuit and a rowboat. Um, he brought him back to the location. He paddled out toward the vehicle but the truck was more or less unreachable at this point, and he could do nothing to attempt saving Peter's wife. Once pulled from the lake, Patricia was transported to the hospital, the same hospital where she worked the last 17 years, and hospital staff was unable to save their coworker. When her blood was tested, her blood alcohol content, her BAC, the level was around 0 0.055, which is just below the legal limit. Along County Road 35, where Patricia and Peter had been traveling that fateful night, either side of the roadway is lined with guardrails, all for except one small break between the guardrails. And coincidentally, or not so coincidentally, this is the exact spot where Patricia veered off the road to avoid the deer. So police, however, found no signs of skid marks on the road or in the grass leading up to where the truck went into the lake. 
once they removed the truck from the lake's bottom, the door Peter said he exited out of after the crash was both still shut and locked. So later, Peter told police that he meant he climbed out of a window. There's nothing to indicate if any of the windows were rolled down. Evidence, however, began pointing towards something other than a mere motor vehicle accident. So further suspicious uh, findings gave police additional pause. In Patricia's hair and on her clothing were seed pods known as burdocks. Burdocks, just to give you a little explanation, are a member of the Daisy family and are a stout common weed with burrs that stick to clothing or animal fur. Little round, roundish, they have little thorny things on them, and they, when they grab on, they hold on. I'm sure if you live in the area anyway, you've seen them, you know what they are, and you've pulled them off of your clothing. But if investigators found no burdocks around the lake. There were none in the area. There were burdock weeds in the uh, Walswick's yard, especially in their backyard. To add to that, one of the burdock branches in the backyard was broken, and on the bent weed, officers recovered strands of Patricia's hair. Okay? following with me so far so perhaps among another damning piece of evidence were the burdocks they found also affixed to peter's shoes he probably didn't even realize it so you've got no burdocks anywhere near the area where the truck went into the water but there are burdocks in the backyard where this couple lived and they both had them affixed to them. Patricia having them stuck in her hair. The Broome County pathologist James Terzian at first signed off on drowning as the cause of death, even though he had identified scrapes and, I'm going to not pronounce this correctly, petechial, petechial, petechial hemorrhages on her body. Petechial, petechial hemorrhages on her body. That's the best I can do. Police theorized the actual events from that night. They figured Peter left the kids with the babysitter on purpose. He let her have some drinks before taking her out back and strangled her. After he dragged her body through the grass, this is where the burdock stuck to her clothing in her hair and onto his shoes. So then he put her into the truck he drove toward the lake, and he stopped at the spot where there was a break in the guardrails and then steered the vehicle, uh, the vehicle toward the water. And then before the, cr uh, the truck crashed into the lake, he jumped out. It's a very plausible, very plausible scenario. Otherwise, the pieces didn't just fit together. This way, they did. And they made sense. The only thing missing from this murder was motive. Patricia and Peter seemed happy enough, right? We said that earlier. In fact, in February 2002, just weeks prior to Patricia's death, Peter bought his wife a new stethoscope and blood pressure device. He gave them to her as a surprise on her birthday while at the Angel Inn. And then officers discovered Patricia's diary. And this is where this story takes a little bit of a turn. Not John Gimetto, just a turn. In the diary, investigators learned that the couple had invited a third person into their sexual escapades. The third person was Joyce Warden, the babysitter. So over time, though, Patricia thought Peter was more interested in sex with the babysitter. Patricia was convinced the two were meeting and having sex and excluding her from those activities. Between the mortgage and the loan for the bar, the couple was into the bank for over 
and fifty thousand dollars so we've got some motive accumulating we've got debt a new girlfriend perhaps sole custody of the kids where in a divorce that was far from likely the police had what they needed and on april 8th they arrested peter for the murder of his wife patricia he was held without bail for the trial peter amended his statement again he said the reason he lied in the first place was to prote uh, protect patricia's reputation he said this time when they went to pick the kids up from the babysitter patricia was drunk he smelled the alcohol it was on her breath so he asked her to pull over she became angry with his request and purposely drove the truck into the lake and then refused to get out of the vehicle as it sank. I'm not buying it. This is what he said this time. It's always, he just seems to keep building and building. The trial took some twists and turns as the defense uh, hired a scuba diver who found a burdock at the bottom of the lake and went on the stand. The babysitter explained, Patricia instigated the three-way sex, but that she and Peter did have sex with just the two of them as well. So we got the scuba diver. He finds a burdock at the bottom of the lake. She's inside the truck. She did not get out of the truck. So even if there was a burdock at the bottom of the lake, how did it get in her hair and on her clothes if she was inside the truck? Unless... The window that Peter escaped out of was open, and they floated in while the truck was the truck cab was filling with water. I don't know. I'm not an investigator. I wasn't there. Just the potential. Just if I'm trying to play devil's advocate here. According to the Press and Sun Bulletin, Warden, the babysitter, contracted con contract. Sorry about that. Ward and the babysitter contradicted earlier testimony that Peter had kicked his wife so hard he left the imprint of his cowboy boot in her chest. Warden said Peter actually lost his balance and stepped on his wife's chest after his wife kicked him in the genitals. So maybe happy enough wasn't what was really going on at home. And this was just it uh, brought in and to just to show that Warden also changed her story a few times as well. She refuted reports Peter abused his wife while on the stand. But she made that statement to the press and son previously. So Rebecca Reisner's forensics file now website is filled with details. And her book is a, a wonderfully compelling fast read. She writes on her website, she writes the following. District Attorney Joseph McBride had a host of witnesses to call to the stand. Patty's supervisor testified how Patty was okay at work, but dreaded going home. Colleagues wanted her to get away from Peter. Another co-worker testified how Patty said one time Peter held a gun to her head during an argument. On the night Patricia died, Jessica Becker told the court Peter showed up at her house with dry hair. Supposedly, he had just been submerged in the lake moments before. Dr. Michael Baden testified Patty had no water in her lungs and someone had likely choked her before she entered the lake. Broome County pathologist James uh, Terzian ultimately concurred Patty died from asphyxiation that she was strangled. I don't know why sometimes I just have a tough time with words. It's ironic. Anyway, uh, the prosecution also held that wet burdock wouldn't stick to hair or clothing. She must have picked them up before she plunged into the water. A bar patron named Brenda Golden told the court that Peter had once said he knew how to kill someone and make it look like an accident. That doesn't prove anything. I watch a ton of true crime, true crime shows, and but 
it just all compiles it all just keeps adding up one one witness after another throwing these things out for the jury to listen to andrew freight an accident reconstruction expert and i found this part this to be the most some of the most interesting and it was on the forensic file show as well uh, explained how the truck didn't sustain enough damage to support peter's claim patty hightailed it into the lake and in the show they conducted a number of road tests, driving vehicles at different speeds into the lake. In every instance, the front grille of the car sustained uh, damage, and the win windows would shatter. Headlights were smashed. Their truck, nothing. It actually just looked like it was pulled out of, backwards out of a car wash. So none of these things... Um, happened to their truck so it was essentially unmolested by the accident and while peter said the truck sank immediately that was also proven inaccurate and we know that because the neighbor came with his little rowboat and he was gonna get out there and get her out of the truck before it completely went under so this vehicle is just floating if patricia's alive uh, she had more than ample time to get out of the vehicle but that's that's not what happened. That's not the case. The test uh, the tested vehicles floated for quite a while, taken on water, sure, but they floated for a while before sinking, long enough for anyone to get out of the truck before it sank. As I just stated, the jury delivered a guilty verdict after deliberating for two and a half to four hours. Accounts on the jury deliverance uh, vary. So between two, two and a half to four hours, they, they thought about whether or not Peter was guilty. And then they found him guilty. And Peter was sentenced to 25 years to life. During his, his interview with Forensic Files, because they did let him speak with the, the crew, Peter said he couldn't get justice because he wasn't wealthy. But he managed to get his conviction voided at least twice amid claims he didn't receive a fair trial. Both times, though, he was found guilty again. But what about the kids? Because there's a lot of kids involved here. So Patricia's mother, Joyce, was appointed as the administrator of Patricia's $284,000 estate. Peter's father took in the couple's daughters. And it's unclear where Patricia's son ended up when everything was said and done. I'm, I'm not sure where he ended up. While imprisoned, Sometime around 2019, Peter married again, this lady Heather that we mentioned at the beginning of the episode. She's the one uh, that's spearheading the campaign to have him freed. She believes P uh, Peter was wrongly convicted and is a victim of political conspiracies. She, she, she thinks that because it was an election year, they wanted a fast conviction on this and didn't put in any of the work to figure out who had actually killed Patricia or what had actually taken place. I think the evidence stacked against Peter refutes that. I did find a fundraiser account um, online that she started, and in the four years it's been up and running, zero dollars have been contributed to that account. So far, as of today, Peter remains locked away for the murder of his wife, Patricia, and will not be eligible for parole until the end of 2026 or early 2027. And there we go. Thank you for listening to this latest episode of What Were They Thinking? A True Crime Podcast. Be sure to subscribe, follow, like, share. And as always, we'll see you next time. Have a great day.